Well, today we are working on the 73 Mustang. And what we're working on is a problem with the cooling system. If you look at the back of the um, radiator shroud near the radiator filler, you'll see residue. Looks like hard water spots. But what happened is that the engine was running on a hot day and the coolant got so hot that it boiled over, which is really hard to do with these things. So now we're gonna find out how it is we diagnose the problem and fix it. This doesn't have a typical cooling system. In this case, I put dual electric fans behind the radiator and we have a thermostat, an adjustable thermostat that we can tell the fans when to turn on, when to turn off. Part of that system includes a wire that goes from the thermostat up through a conduit and to an LED light group that will show a driver when power has been sent to the fans. So we can tell when we're driving if the fans are turned on or not. I just did that for fun. Well, now we're going to talk about how to diagnose this. But before we do that, let me show you the equipment we're going to use. Very, very simple. A test light. The test light has a ground clip. This ground clip I attach to a good ground and then I test to make sure the light is working. Very little is more frustrating than trying to diagnose an electrical system with a test light with a burned out bulb. The bulb works. The way that this is wired is I take battery voltage from a terminal on the starter relay and I send it down to a circuit breaker. I take off the cap. This side of the circuit breaker should be hot, and it is, it has power. The other one should have power also. It does also. I had suspected this is, was the problem area when this all happened yesterday, but no, the, re, uh, the circuit breaker is good. So then I want to test to make sure the thermostat is working. But to do all that now, I need Linda to turn the power on with the ignition switch. So we'll do that next. Power it on. Okay. This thermostat, I can adjust the temperature at which it sends a voltage to a special relay, which then turns the fans off or turns them on. There's two connectors to the thermostat. One is hot, the other one is not. When the thermostat is set at a temperature higher than the coolant temperature. In this case, it is set for 200 degrees right now but the coolant is not that hot, it's cold. We haven't started the engine yet today. So to test this, I will set this thermostat to a much lower temperature and listen to it click. <laughs> well, that just gave away what the problem was. Anyway, it's clicked and now when I test, I still have power here and I have power here off on when the power comes on the thermostat that means that power is being sent to this relay now this relay yesterday i suspected was the problem so i replaced it with one i carry in the car and it didn't do any good so it wasn't the problem so what i do is i look at the wires this orange wire 
is a fairly small wire. It goes to a terminal that is hot right now. When I turn the thermostat up, no more power because the thermostat isn't sending current to it. Now it's on. There's a red and yellow wire, big ones. Red wire comes from the batteries through the circuit breaker we tested earlier. We got power. Fans are off, the yellow wire, nothing. Fans should be on and we got power. So the relay, the thermostat and circuit breaker are all working. What's going on? Well, a few moments ago, the fan started to run. I was hoping that wouldn't happen yet because I want to show you where the problem is kind of at. I haven't diagnosed exactly the cause yet, but I started getting ready to test this circuit and this happened. Fans run. Fans turned on. I put this back into where it was, and fans go off. What's wrong? Something that is called an intermittent open circuit is what's wrong. I haven't cut the wire ties holding this conduit in place yet to see exactly the cause of the problem, but I suspect it might be a connector I'm using I use some quick connects for the electrical for this system. The good news is it goes together quickly. The bad news is sometimes they don't work very well, inconsistently. I'll find out. The other thing I want to point out is we have some quick splices here and here, and there's one down here, this blue one. Well, that doesn't look right. What happened? Well. This little brown wire, I believe, is part of the front camera. And the front camera was not working as expected. And it turned out that I used a quick connect to connect this to a ground wire that is screwed into the frame, the radiator support, and it became disconnected. So we don't have a ground. So the front camera's not working. I was gonna work on that later today, but that's not what's causing this problem with the fans. It's just something I found along the way. So I'll move this to the side and I'll get back to that later. But I wanted to point that out in case anybody noticed this quick connect was popped off. Okay, I'm going to have Linda stop the video. I'll get some cutting instruments. I'll cut this thing open to expose the wires and see if I can find out what's causing this problem. Oh. Because I am going to be testing some heavier, larger wires, I got a different connector on this test light. This one actually will hook a wire and I pulled out and it's got an end that will pierce the insulation and it's safer for me to use instead of something I'm pushing and to stab myself. So first I test to make sure the light is good. Then I have the thermostat set down real low so the fans should be on. <coughs> this is the yellow wire that I use to see if the fans are running or not and they should be on, but they're not. Well, those connect into a small connector here that is well insulated with shrink wrap to two red wires, one red wire per fan. And the one fan is working, 
with current but not turning. The other fan circuit is also working with current going to it, but it's not turning. What the heck? All right, so there is no connection further than these red wires than over here, where these plug into the fans themselves. Now I could go ahead and test those and make sure they're getting power. And I am betting that they do. Let me use the other tester. I need more of a probe this time than something that hooks the wire. Attach ground. It works. Come down here. The red wire is hot. And this one is hot. If I go to the ground side, the ground is hot. This is the black wire that comes back to the car. In theory, if the fans are working and the ground is good, the ground wire should not have any current activated this light. So, what else is in this area that could be causing a problem? I got two black wires. These are the ground wires from the fans. They're going to a ground. The ground looks good. What about the connector? Check this out. There's a problem with the connector for ground. That's the issue. So I found the source of the problem. Now I gotta cut this open and re-terminate this. Meantime, let me demonstrate what I mean by the ground circuit should not be lighting up when the fans are running. There's the ground circuit. When the circuit is completed at ground, there's not enough voltage out there on the ground side of the fan load to light the light. So that's my first indication. There's a ground problem. The ground wire has current lighting up the light. This is the other way. So anyway, I'm going to go ahead, go off camera, put these wiring conduits back in place to make this real nice and pretty. Take this apart, re-terminate that ground, and I am betting that after that the fans will start working properly and I will reconnect to another splice lock, the ground for the front camera. I bet that starts working also. All right, we'll be back. I've taken the ground off of the mount and I'm now cutting away at the shrink wrap tube I used to protect this connector, connector uh, connection connector from whatever elements water dirt just keep it clean didn't do me much good as it turns out this ground connection is not carrying the current it should which allowed the fans to not work which then caused the engine to overheat. So I'm gonna cut away at this shrink wrap tubing, which is doing a good job of protecting the connection. And as you can see, I'm trying to get down there and cut, and it's not going easily, and it's not tearing away like it should without difficulty. Now, it feels like it should be a good connection. As I wiggle these wires, they're in tight. So I'm not sure why it failed, but it could be because I tried stuffing two wires into 
a connector that was really designed for one wire. So I'm going to fix that by making this ground connection connect up to a different series of connectors. And hopefully it will eliminate the problem I was running into. So now we're going to go off camera. I'll get some new connectors and I'll start putting things Okay, I'm getting ready to connect up the new ground connectors. This is a box of shrink wrap tube. Shrink wrap is made of a plastic that when it gets hot, it shrinks. So what I'm gonna do is put the tube down over my first ground connection. Now off camera, I put a new crimp on here. I stripped the insulation enough so that insulation being peeled off, let some of the conductive material come through so I can make sure it's crimped right there. Very nicely done. So now what I'm gonna do is strip the other one to show how that's done. I use some wire strippers. There's different size cutting holes on these pliers with different size wires. So I go to the appropriate size wire to strip, wire size. I squeeze the pliers in a few places that cut the insulation and then I peel it right off. Then I like to twist these strands so they're all together. Then I'll get shrink wrap. It's around the wire now, around the installation. And then I will get my next eyelet connector. It is using a blue insulator end, which indicates the size wire is good for. And this wire is the right size for this type of connector. Put it on. I have some of the wire poking through. So with the wire poking through, I then crimp this thing down. Crimp it with a tighter squeeze. And then I tug on it just to make sure it's solid. And it is. My next step is to take this ground wire for the front camera. I had been splicing with the splice lock and I'm gonna give it its own eyelet at the end. So I'll cut off this old end. I will strip it. try to strip it. This is a much tougher insulation. It's a lot heavier plastic, harder to cut. Just the way they did things with that particular wire. Now it is also ready for an end connector. I also want to put wire tying around it or shrink wrap around it. So I'll get another shrink wrap tube out. This is much longer than necessary, but it's not gonna hurt. I 
I'll get the next connector. And you see the conductive material wire coming through. So I'll crimp this nice and tight. So it's solid. Now all three of those are gonna be held down with a screw that is used to help hold the thermostat control housing bracket. It already has one screw in place holding the bracket. This makes for a good ground simply because the screw goes into the radiator support bracket and it is connected very solidly to the car electrically as a good ground so I put the screw into place and then I will run it down first I want to make sure I'm not going to cross thread the old threads the screw cut before. So I go backwards and then I go in. I go backwards until I feel it drop into place. Now I'll tighten it down without over tightening. Over tightening will cause me to strip the threads that have been cut into the support already. I don't want to do that. When do you do the shrink wrap? Um... Oh, I'm going to do the shrink wrap. Once all this is together, I'll apply heat to this and they shrink up. I, I could have done it before, but I felt like getting this out of the way. Okay, those are tight. Can't move them. They're very shrink ramp. Let's test. Linda will turn the ignition on. One more fans. Make sure they work. Ignition on. Oh, we've got fan. Okay, now the shrink wrap. I'll put the tubing into place. Where the insulator ends of these connectors will be covered by the tube. So no blue will be showing. Then I get my heat gun and there is a heat gun that looks like and is actually designed like a hair dryer, but it's made to apply heat to different mechanical items. Everything's in place. I'll set this to high and away we go.
Okay, the shrink wrap tightened down on the wires and on the connector ends of the installation pieces. So somebody might be asking, hey, it's just a ground circuit. Why are you bothering being so careful? Well, as you saw earlier in this video, ground circuit is pretty important to the electrical flow working properly. Is there bad ground that caused all this to begin with in the ground physically looked good when I looked at the end of the ground connector where it had been connected to those two wires separately it felt good but something was wrong in here I had an intermediate open circuit that kept the ground from flowing. This time, one ground per wire. I could have put them all together and done a splice lock with a single ground, but I decided, you know, I've been hurt once. I'm not going to get hurt again. The other question might be, why am I bothering using shrink wrap on something like this? Shrink wrap does three things. The first thing it does is it insulates wire from coming in touch with things it shouldn't. Not the case here because if the wire was exposed and hit ground, it's going to go to ground anyway, no big deal. The other reason for it is to protect the connections from weather intrusion, dust, dirt, water. So I don't want corrosion in here, so I make sure that these are sealed. The other thing that's good about these is that they keep the insulation from chafing through in the event this is touching something metal like this frame which this is over the course of years it might rub through the insulation because it's a ground it's not a big deal but i prefer it not happen there's actually a fourth reason for it it looks better it's a cleaner look okay well i tested Wiggle the wires, everything's still working good. I'll set this temperature back to 205 degrees on the thermostat. Put the tools away, throw away the scrap material. And then it's time for me to go out with Linda on the test drive somewhere we can have a nice lunch. I think that sounds like fun, don't you, honey? Excellent, good job. Okay. And one more thing we need to say. Thank you, dear, for helping me. Nope. Our good, wonderful daughter-in-law-to-be. Oh. Her first drive with one of our pony cars, and this thing overheated on her. So It wasn't she, her fault. It was not her fault. She did nothing wrong, and we hope that she can forgive this wonderful car that we have so much fun in. Truly, it's one of my favorite pony cars that we have, and... I want her to like it as much as I like it. So have faith, Heather. We fixed the problem. It was not anything you did. No, I did it without knowing it. I thought I had a good connection. It had been working intermittently, incidentally. Intermittent electrical problems are notoriously difficult to troubleshoot and find. I got lucky. Moreover, the great majority of mysterious electrical problems I have found are because of exactly what this was, a bad ground. In this case, double bad, it was intermittent bad ground. I found it by good fortune. All I would have had to do was bump this wire and everything would have mysteriously started working and I might not have ever been able to realize, oh, it's because it's this, off on, off on, as I wiggle it. 
It might have just been a mystery forever. But I got lucky. I found that I, I, I found that over the years, a lot of times when people would bring their cars to a repair shop or another Ford dealership with an unusual problem, it would often wind up with me with all kinds of new parts and this was done and that was done and no one else can find the problem. What the good news is, I already knew what I didn't have to worry about when I was looking for the cause of a problem because so many new parts were already installed I could see that there were good parts and they were done right. So I knew to look somewhere else. So that gave me an advantage diagnostically. But the other thing I found is if a person focuses on this is taking too long to find this problem, I'll never get paid for it and they give up, which is what typically happens. I come along, my thinking was, I'll learn something from this and I'll be a better technician for it, even if I don't get paid for all the diagnostic time. If this took me six hours to find, how could I possibly, in my heart of hearts, charge someone for six hours of labor time, $110 an hour, to find something that took less than 15 minutes to fix? Yep, it happens in the automotive world. Any guy who works on electrical and electronic issues will tell you, it happens. But my secret was a lot of the time someone else had tried doing the repairs first, I knew what not to bother with. I'd double check it, but I wouldn't just start replacing parts, I'd start digging. And eventually I would find the issue. And the payback for me was sometimes I found it quickly, got paid. Other times it would take half a day or more. And I would charge for what it should have taken had I known better. Now I know better. So instead of charging six or eight hours for a job or four hours, I might charge half an hour or one hour diagnostic and repair time. But the next time I'd see that kind of a situation, I'd be ready for it. And I would take 15 minutes to find and fix the problem or verify and fix the problem. I would still charge an hour because that was what I felt was a net effective value of what I did. No one ever complained. They got the cars back working. I felt good about it. So there you go. Don't worry about the short run. Look at the long run. Okay, I'm done now.